And now uh, I'm going to invite my next guest to this show. Uh, she is amazing, smart woman, uh, my fellow female fighter in this fight against um, this, how to say, anti-China smear campaigns. So uh, she's the researcher with Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and also a member of the Dongsheng News. So Ting's check, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jingjing. Jing. What a pleasure to be back on your show. <laughs> Looking good, sister. I think we, we, we knew we were going to wear red, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I think many of you already, already know Ting's Jack. You know what, Ting's? Uh, the interview that we just did uh, discussing the COVID situation in China, I've received a lot of comments from the people from the Chinese diaspora community from around the world. Uh, I know I always have this Chinese diaspora followers as, as, uh, to my channel, but I think this video particularly got many comments from those people in those groups. So, so the, the very, they feel related to your story and they really want to know more about your story. So uh, how about you tell us more about yourself? Sure. I mean, I'm a Chinese person, um, born in Hong Kong, but grew up in the West, in the great big free West. I grew up in Canada, but I've since kind of returned back to the global South, having spent some time in South Africa and Brazil and now live in Beijing. So uh, I would say I'm, I'm a Chinese person, but only got to see um, mainland China in first hand and live here for the last three years during, a, I would say, a very interesting time. So maybe we'll get into some of those topics in the next little bit. Mm. So we've just because Tings is my really good for, good friend. We talk a lot uh, in, in private that uh, this we are facing a huge smear campaign or anti-China propaganda coming from the West, and uh, as people from this Chinese grew up in Chinese culture and uh, seeing China we, and especially facing this huge Western smear campaigns, we feel this huge pressure. Like, what can we do? And I'm particularly interested because I know why I'm doing this because when I first wanted to work more on this channel, it's just to bring all the voices that people don't hear, either from China or other global South countries to the Western audience. But you, I'm wondering how come you decided to join this war, this very difficult war in challenging this Western narrative? How come you came to realize that's the mission that we really need to, need to do? I mean, I think first and foremost, I'm a socialist and I do believe in the project of socialism and the kind of long decades of construction that China has been part of um, in, in, in building this. And we've seen kind of incredible gains, whether economically, socially, uh, culturally, um, in, this, in this sort of multi-decade struggle. But at the same time, I think it's about accessing information. I mean, right now we're in a situation where uh, to understand anything about China is pretty much filtered through the lens of Western mainstream media. Uh, and it seems like, and I think one of the things we saw uh, with the recent changes in the COVID policy and really since Wuhan out, uh, outbreak uh, first happened at the end of 2019, it seems like it doesn't really matter what China does. Um, uh, when it starts, you know, imposing lockdowns because the virus is unknown uh, or the virus is deadly and there are no vaccines to protect the people, then they called it repression. Uh, when China tried to innovate new policies to combat and contain the virus, well, that's, you know, mass surveillance. Uh, when China tried to, let's say, I don't know, offer vaccines to other countries, particularly global south countries, okay, that's, you know, political vaccine diplomacy. Uh, when China tries to host, you know, the Winter Olympics in a safe way, that's dystopic. So it seems like there's no way of really winning. And, and part of it is also a personal way of wanting to understand China more for myself to get the facts and wade through the misinformation. And I think me and, uh, and you mentioned I'm part of Dongsheng as well as Tricontinental, but Dongsheng really came about in this moment of the outbreak of the pandemic and realizing that uh, people, especially people of the Global South, uh, need information about China. Uh, and so we're a group of researchers that kind of got together from around the world, uh, from South Africa to Zambia to Argentina to Brazil, and some people also based in China, just to get the facts. And I think 
Uh, the work like you're, you're doing and the work that we're trying to do is just to get information. It's not even necessarily about defending China so much as getting something out there um, that is um, truthful, has facts to it, and is of interest to you know, the people of the world. Mm. So why you think it's very important for the Global South to get the correct information from China? Why you think, uh, what major events in China that you think are crucial for the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think what your previous uh, guest just said around, you know, media being a bit of a smokescreen, I think that's the reality we're living in. Um, there's a kind of um, almost like a distraction mechanism at best and, and much more insidious at worst in terms of undermining China and the Chinese people. Um, and oftentimes you don't actually get the content because it's almost like, oh, look over there, there's a flying elephant. And, and the message is China is bad somehow. Um, but one of the most important events, having followed closely and living here over um, the last year, I would say is the uh, CPC National Congress, which is the twice a decade event uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and where it not only determines internally for the party and for the country where the direction is heading, but it has an impact um, for the world because they give a sense of how China sees itself, how it sees its development in, in relation to the rest of the world. And I think one of the things that is really um, striking for me when I was following this closely, and you were there covering it on the ground, um, was this affirmation of socialism. You know, Marxism was said over 30 times. There was a consistent look at the people-centered nature of a socialist project. And I think second to that, and this is where it's important for uh, the Global South, is it um, put forward a question of a China model of modernization. And so this makes us ask, what kind of modernization and through what means? Well, it defines you know, what, you know, in the speech especially that uh, Xi Jinping gave from the 19th, the previous Congress, was looking at, okay, for a large society, for a, a large population, uh, questions of common prosperity, how do you balance sort of the material and the environmental and the cultural development of a country? How do you balance human and uh, uh, in nature? And how do you promote peace in your development? And, but also what it talks about was what it is not. And in that, there was actually quite a strong condemnation of the path of Western capitalist modernization. Um, and one of the quotes that I really quite liked is saying that China is not treading the path, the old path of war, uh, colonization, and I think plunder taken uh, by some countries, some countries, um, that brutal and bloodstained path of enrichment at the expense of others and has caused great suffering to developing countries. And I think that's really strong. I mean, anyone from the global south, from the former colonized countries, still, there are still some colonies now, um, we know this bloodstained path all too well. And even after the process of liberating ourselves, you know, especially in Asian Africa in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, what were the options, the so-called options that the U.S.-led West offered? I mean, they were structural adjustment privatization, neoliberal market policies, a so-called Washington consensus. So in a way, this, um, this path, this Western path, capitalist path to modernization hasn't really brought much good to the people, the environment, and to our independent and sovereign development. So I think what China has been able to do for itself, uh, not only, for example, lifting 850 million people out of poverty in the last four decades, be able to, you know, send a rover to Mars or go to the dark side of the moon or send a woman and do her first spacewalk. You know, these are incredible achievements socially, technologically, economically. But that it's also offering a possibility, not a model to be copied, but a possibility learnings that are useful for the rest of the developing world uh, that has yet to be able to find that independent um, a path of, of prosperity and also one that balances economic needs, but also the needs of the people. Mm. You just brought up all those issues, all those stories that are very important to show the development of China, but almost never been shown by all this Western mainstream media who show their enthusiasm on covering China. They send multiple correspondents based in China but now of this story is being shown by the media. And you mentioned the party congress because I was covering the congress on the ground. And then 
uh, when I see the results of all this Western media coverage, it's just so far from the truth. For example, several media outlets they will choose they would they would choose the several. For example, the when, when President Xi Jinping delivered the work report, uh, it's a, a almost two hours long work report, and uh, go through every section, uh, review what China did in the past, and also look into the future how we're going to develop in economy, in agriculture, in narrow the uh, income in uh, unbalanced distribution, and just every aspect. And then the media, I think it was CNN, it just focused, oh, China vows to use violence to, to on, on Hong Kong, as they are on Taiwan. And I was like, did, did, did you hear the work report? Were you, were you there? Because the work report was almost two hours long. And he did mention about what gonna, what gonna, how China, Chinese mainland going to reunite with Taiwan Island. It was through peaceful ways, but China will never abandon the means to, to, to use violence if there were foreign interferences or separatists. So, and, but that only happened like for several minutes in the entire work report, but they will you know, cherry pick several parts and they amplify it and twist it and to demonize the whole party Congress. And that's what worries me about this anti-China propaganda in the West because uh, not only they are misguiding the people outside of China, to some extent, they also misguided Chinese people, those people, Chinese descendants or Chinese diaspora across the world. When they constantly see their culture, their own country being portrayed like this on the Western atmosphere, some of them feel ashamed about their culture, ashamed about their country. And so that was worries me because they got the young people, young Chinese diaspora, to doubt themselves, to doubt their roots. What's, what's your thought? I mean, it's absolutely. Information is everything. Um, uh, and if we have bad information, we make bad decisions. Um, not only about having a bad conception of a place or a people. And I mean, I think sometimes, and even why we started Dongsheng, wasn't about uh, being pro-China, uh, wasn't about whether or not you like socialism or even believe that China is socialist or not. That's not necessarily the point. The point is, I think it does a great disservice to humanity um, if we shut off the possibility of learning, like, for example, the work report example, which is a great one you gave, uh, to learn from not only the second largest economy, but the largest, most populous country, well, now India is up there, of 1.4 billion people, but a very dynamic society, a civilization of 5,000 years. I mean, it's not exceptional, but it's a place that has uh, much to <coughs> offer, um, and it has a dynamism. Um, and yes, Chinese people are also dynamic because, you know, a lot of times the media seems to portray uh, all, uh, all of us as sort of one unthinking mass of people. But whether you're interested in science, you know, I mentioned some of the things that, I mean, I'm a, a space nerd. So following just the space program that China has been able to do is fascinating. Um, whether you're interested in these sort of social questions like poverty or hunger or the kind of big dilemmas that are facing humanity today, or you're interested in tech, you know, how did, I think one of your guests were talking about build, China build the most extensive high-speed railway in the world when, you know, 70 years ago, it couldn't even uh, produce one car mm -hmm. uh, or environment, you know, the big climate questions of our time. How will China reach its transition to a carbon neutral uh, society by 2050? These are 2060. But these are fascinating questions. And I want to just urge all of us, and I think your viewers are obviously going to be amenable to this, to be stay open, stay curious, seek information. There is so much to be learned. And there's nothing that helps any of us to close the doors and focus on, you know, two sentences in a work report in a week-long meeting that had so much content to offer. Mm. I know you did some field research uh, into some rural regions in China to understand how poverty alleviations was being implemented, how it was carried out, how China lifted those people out of absolute poverty. So can you share some of those stories? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that trip uh, that culminated into a study that we uh, published in Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, which is um, on the poverty campaign, was fundamental for my understanding. And, you know, as someone who didn't grow up inside the mainland to see, go to the countryside, be able to 
you know, more concretely understand, you know, sometimes not, we talk about China and these big numbers. It's hard to conceptualize, it's abstract. When you go to the ground and you see in the countryside, you talk to women, youth, uh, peasants, you talk to the party um, cadre that have been sent far away uh, uh, to live and work with the families to lift them out of poverty and help themselves lift, uh, uh, get ex exit poverty. You learn a lot, it's, it's quite impressive. So what we saw was the impressive capacity to mobilize a variety sec of sectors of society, whether it's the public sector, whether it's the private sector, uh, the people and uh, the peasants in the countryside and to the party itself to be able to kind of lift this last 100 million people who were still living in extreme poverty uh, 10 years ago when Xi Jinping assumed his presidency. Um, so if anyone wants to check that out, that's on our website at the tricontinental.org. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, you know what? You, you, you said you didn't grow up in the mainland, in Chinese mainland, to see this. But you know what? I grew up in, the, in Chinese mainland, but still I didn't understand how, how difficult the job was to lift millions of people out of extreme poverty. And uh, just like you said, I always see poverty alleviation on the news, on textbooks. And uh, by this year, we saw this number of people got lifted out of poverty. And before I w went to those regions, they were all just numbers to me. But it was until I went to those rural regions and see the living conditions of those people, how challenging it was for, uh, to help those people because some of them just really in remote rural regions. For example, in Guangxi, there were mountainous regions. It was difficult to build any road in that region. But, and there were people, so those people were so isolated from the rest of China, the rest of the world actually. So to help those people get out of poverty, you, you really need to start building roads, building infrastructures, and start to provide education because without this uh, uh, being that remote and isolated from the rest of the world, um, it really, you really need to start with the education, trying to change their mindset about almost everything. So it was a tremendous work done, and I saw those people's life being changed. That shocked me, changed me. So it, it, seeing with your own eyes, actually go to the place to see that for yourself, really help, help you to change your perception. So even as, as a Chinese, you know, I need to do this to really understand it. So, and to those people, to those Western, biased Westerners, you know, they didn't even want to make a little effort to really understand what's going on. So that, that's a shame, I gotta say. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, I mean, in, especially in this COVID period, that sort of added to the existing crises that many countries are facing, especially in the global south. You know, we're seeing countries deepening their poverty for the first time in 25 years. We're seeing unemployment. Countries have exited the hunger map, like Brazil, and I know you'll have a guest later talking about Brazil, actually um, falling back into hunger. These are urgent questions of our times. And, and China might not have the solution or the model for all countries, but there are lessons to be learned because they're necessary for, for the world to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Tings. And also, I've prepared several bad China takes for you. <laughs> so you have 10 seconds. I can't wait. <laughs> you have 10 seconds to give a comment to each of those takes. Are you ready? <laughs> Very ready. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Sadly, you know, this is too true. Uh, and unfortunately for any of us who have to engage in the social media world, which is not really a real world, um, this is all too true, you know. I know, I know, you and I, we're both Chinese people who are just sheep that blindly follow the CBC, so we need this, this guy with his little heart there to tell us how much uh, we are unfree. So thank you for your uh, noble work. <laughs> And you know what, I think uh, just, just before the live stream, I showed you the, the tweet from this uh, US-based China expert, senior fellow at an at a institute uh, on China. And he said, it basically means knowing the Chinese language is not necessary to understand China. 
That's the attitude many of the so-called China watchers, China experts in the Western countries are. I mean, of course, knowing a language doesn't mean you can understand the country, or without knowing the, uh, the language, you still can understand some part of the, about this culture. But if you truly want a deep understanding about a culture, especially especially if you are labeling yourself as this senior feller on a country, you need to understand the language. But they don't even want to put the effort. <laughs> Very condescending, racist attitude. Okay. Could agree more. Yeah. The next one. The Schrodinger's China. I mean, I feel like this is almost, especially in this moment, as China's you know relaxing its COVID uh, zero COVID policies. It kind of makes you feel like, wow, make up your mind already. Like, <laughs> I want to know when I wake up in the morning, am I living in a dystopia or not? Like, is it about to collapse or about to take over the world? Because it doesn't seem to make up its mind. Um, you know, am I free or am I not? You know, should we keep <laughs> the borders closed so that I can travel, or will you keep me from traveling to your country because I'm coming from China? <laughs> it's really hard, but I'm waiting for them to make up their mind. <laughs> okay, very good. The next one. Uh oh. Oh, I like this one. This one hits home. <laughs> okay. You know, I guess, um, where do I begin? I would just say, what kinds of freedoms and democracy did the Chinese people under 156 years of British colonialism really live, you know? And I think sometimes, and, and this angers me quite a lot, you know, since the handover in 1997, which is 25 years ago, you know, there was never such thing as sort of universal suffrage. There wasn't um, a... Uh, you know, the, 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 the democracy that is so preached and somehow uh, defended by the last governor, which is Chris Patton, who was one of the first people to come out and defend, you know, Hong Kong's freedom today, even though co you know, coincidentally or ironically, he was the, the last seat of the, the colonial power. Um, you know, from the beginning, uh, even when the first legislative council was made uh, in Hong Kong under British rule, who could participate? It's the colonial landowners. It's not the Chinese people, the so-called Hong Kongers. So in a way, I think it's interesting now that they want to give us our freedoms, the freedoms that they never gave us over <laughs> 156 years. So thanks. A little bit late, but it's better late than ever. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I like your rent. <laughs> Let's take a look at the next one. Ooh. ooh. Oh, wow. Any, okay. Wow. So, I, I mean, I guess this is, it's, I want to say it's ridiculous, but at the same time, I actually think a lot of people believe that, and that's what's frightening. I mean, this is the kind of, I think, age-old warmongering language that the U.S. likes to, to use, the kind of, if you're not with us, then you're against us, and, mm -hmm. and I think there is, it's part of this provocation of war and creating the sentiment and the climate so that the people will support war. But I think on a serious note, I think especially for those who are Chinese of Chinese descent or even Asian living in the United States, this kind of uh, xenophobia that's being actively promoted and acted upon is really dangerous, you know? And I think we are reverting to uh, a kind of anti-communist and anti-Chinese xenophobic language that has probably existed always in the US, but means, um, you know, seeing more attacks, it means uh, that more people's lives, especially who seem Chinese, are at risk. It means that they are more surveilled and, and kind of persecuted just by the virtue of what they look like. So I think it's a dangerous thing, even though this is actually not a joke. Mm. It is very dangerous. Like, you are either with us or with, uh, we, uh, against us, this attitude. Also this McCarthyism. So this created this red scare, but now this like, China scare. If you dare to not criticize either China or someone or like socialist, then you are one of them and you will be demonized. That's a very dangerous attitude. So Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. Jing Jing, I'm sorry, but both of us are really red, so I don't know if we have <laughs> much hope. We are the red scare. <laughs> You know what also uh, made me real, because I'm very happy that uh, uh, I, I have you, my fellow female Chinese woman, uh, join this fight against this anti-China narratives. 
And uh, because I think Chinese women or Asian women in general are one of those groups that are being demonized uh, the most in Western cultures. So it's important that we work together and uh, fight against this Western bias and uh, narratives. So it's okay to be proud to be a socialist. It's okay to be proud of our Chinese culture and Chinese roots. So it's very important to um, show all the Chinese diaspora uh, how important to get a real, uh, the correct perception of our own culture. So thank you so much, Tings, for joining me. Um, before I let you go, uh, tell us, tell our viewers where to find your work. Sure. I mean, you can find uh, the work of Dongsheng and, and Tricontinental on all the social media platforms. Dongsheng News and then Tricontinental. And then you can also follow me by searching Ting's check. But thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. And anytime, I'm happy to be part of the Red Scare with you. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, guys, you will see more of Ting's check in 2023 on my channel. So if you like Ting's check, follow my channel, subscribe to my channel. <laughs> and thank you so much, Ting's. Uh, looking forward to having more on this show. Bye. Bye-bye.